We're having a board meeting and we're saying we need a vehicle to be able to travel around. We didn't have any money. I'd gone down to a local used car place and found this Toyota Coaster. I think it was $9,000. And we were praying for a vehicle. While we were praying, the phone rings. It was a local businessman who said, hey, I was just thinking about you guys and the ministry you started and that. And he said, I got a little bit of money here. And he said, I was wondering, do you have a specific need at the moment? Wow. And I said, yeah, we actually need a vehicle and we've got one in mind. And he said, well, I've got $9,000 here. <laughs> wow. you, I, hey, and welcome to Zero Compromise, helping you stand for truth in a world that falls for lies. I'm Patricia Angler, joined here at the Creation Museum by Jessica D. Ford, a.k.a. JJ. Hello. And Rocket Rob Webb. Hey, guys. And we have a very special conversation. So what's going on today, JJ? We are so honored. We have Ken Ham. He is the founder and CEO of Answers in Genesis, the Creation Museum, and the Ark Encounter. We're really looking forward to the conversation. And make sure you guys Stay tuned for this whole conversation. It's going to be an amazing conversation with Ken Ham. We're going to hear more about his testimony. And make sure you guys also like, share, and subscribe because the more times you like and subscribe, we're able to get this message out to more people, ultimately spreading the gospel to as many people as possible. So with that, it only took us uh, about a year to finally get Ken Ham onto our show. So thank you for coming on. So for the maybe five people watching that don't know who you are, uh, go ahead and tell us a little bit about who you are and what your role is at the ministry. Well, I guess I should use a word like g'day. <laughs> Something like that. So uh, people know that uh, I originally come from Australia. So uh, I was a high school teacher, actually. And uh, we started a ministry in our home in 1977. And this you is a result of that then, ministry. Right? Today. Uh, nope. <laughs> you weren't even born then. Not for a couple decades. <laughs> My parents weren't even thinking about me yet. Yeah, so uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Answers in Genesis, which is an apologetics ministry, which doesn't mean we apologize for our faith, as you know. Apologetics means to give logical reason defense of the faith. And also, we built the two leading Christian-themed attractions in the world, the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. And would you believe the burden for the Creation Museum goes back to the 70s? Wow. I became a high school teacher in 1975, and it was a result of my interaction with the students and seeing evolution being a big stumbling block and so on, and then starting to speak uh, in churches because I gave my first apologetics talk in 1975 in a Baptist church in a little country town called Dolby and found people saying, we didn't know you could believe Genesis. We didn't know what to do with evolution. And then talking in Bible studies and finding more of that and realizing when I took the students to museums, it was always from an atheistic evolutionary perspective and saying, Lord, why can't we have a creation museum? You know, sort of like Nehemiah. Why doesn't somebody rebuild the wall? You know, what is wrong with people? Why can't we do something? And so I picked up that sort of Nehemiah anger, if you like, from my father, who was very much like that. Well, why doesn't somebody do something about this? You know, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's where the burden for the Creation Museum came from. That was before you were born. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you initially started teaching in a public school, right? It was in a public school that you started? Yes, it was public school. Mm -hmm. uh, so I taught there for five years uh, and... Uh, the first time I, I, I taught a class, first science class, because I was a science teacher, the student said to me, so I heard you're a Christian because my name was listed as going to actually run the Christian group in the school. And I said, yes. And they said, well, how can you be a Christian? Because we know the Bible's not true. I said, how do you know the Bible's not true? And they said, because of what's in our textbooks about evolution and millions of years. And that's when I started teaching. You know, back then we had the freedom to do this, but I started teaching them the answers that I'd already been able to obtain. And I started to search for more answers to help them understand it was interesting because one of the things I did right from the start was to teach students how to think correctly about science. You know, there's a big difference between mixing things in a laboratory or testing metals or whatever you're doing and talking about origins. Big difference. Uh, you know, we, we today label that as historical science when you're talking about beliefs about the past or observational science using your five senses in the present uh, to develop technology and so on. And so I always explain to the students the difference between the interpretation of the evidence and the evidence itself. We have to interpret the evidence. It depends upon the belief that we have. And so what happened was when they would go to other teachers and teachers try to teach them evolution, they would say, but you're interpreting that evidence based on these beliefs and the teachers got mad at me. Uh, so I started to get teachers upset with me right back then in 1975 because I taught students how to think, which is very radical for education, you know, mm -hmm. teaching right. teaching them how to think. But that started right back then. And that's that's when the burden for the Creation Museum came about. Lord, why can't, why can't we have a place that teaches them the truth? You know, and that that burden intensified uh, over the years. And look where we are today. Mm -hmm. Of course. Super cool. You know, that was yeah, 
48 years ago or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the common questions I always get here at the museum as well as the Ark Encounter is people always go up to me and they're like, how is all this possible, right? Mm -hmm. They look at the finished product, they're like, how could all of this come together? What's your usual response to people when they when they say that to you? Wow. You know, you know it's interesting. I have people say that to me all the time that because they come here and they see these incredible places. I mean, they're the quality of Disney. I think they're above mm -hmm. Disney in quality. Absolutely. And you've got these exhibits and we stand boldly for God's word and the gospel. There's non-Christians come, 30% non-Christian we know come to the Ark, uh, and also a large percentage of non-Christians also come to the Creation Museum. And we're bold about the gospel. And they see the, I mean, these are world-class leading attractions, the two leading Christian-themed attractions in the world, nothing like them anywhere else, you know, the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. And they look at that and they say, how could this be? How did this come about? Because, you know, the secular world has all this stuff. You know, how could you have that in the Christian world? And, uh, well, it's a God thing, right? Mm, <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting that, but, but, but it's a lesson of responsibility and faith. And that's what you have to understand. There's a lot of lessons of faith in this. It's also a lesson of calling that God, I believe, did call me to do this. And I testify to that, and I believe that calling... I, I can I think way back actually beyond my days of of a teacher even way before that but God had a had a, had a calling on my life but uh, it's it's lessons of responsibility and faith and of standing up for for God's word and and understanding when. God calls you to do something and you're prepared to step out and do it, he does things that are beyond our comprehension. You know, when the ark was opened, I'll never forget, it was a CNN reporter that looked at the exhibits and we were talking about the fact that we had our own design uh, team. That That's a whole miraculous aspect of things in itself and the way that came about. But they said, where'd you find all these talented people? And and also I get asked that today, even, even in regard to speakers like yourselves and researchers and all our designers and artists and so on. How did you find all these people? And my first answer uh, to that question, because I've been asked that question many times since, I've been asked it by Christians too. Mm -hmm. But the, the first time I had that question, I said, I thought to myself and just sort of sprung into my mind, I said, well, to be honest, just as God brought the animals to Noah, he brought these people to us. And That's a good answer. You know, and, and really, that is so. When when we were building the Creation Museum, we didn't tell anybody. We had no idea how we were going to design the exhibits, right? We, we, we didn't even really know what we were going to do because we'd met Buddy Davis. I met Buddy Davis. Uh, and uh, he uh, had, that was in 1994, and he had these dinosaurs that he sculpted and was putting them in shopping centres and renting them. And to, I talked about the burden I had for a creation museum, and he said, oh, I'd love to see our dinosaurs in a creation museum rather than being in sh shopping centres and us travelling around all, all these places. So when we were building the creation museum, uh, we were contacted by a man called Patrick Marsh. Now, Patrick's with the Lord now, mm -hmm. but Patrick had heard about the Creation Museum. That's even an interesting, miraculous story in itself. And contacted us and said, you know, I work for Universal Studios. He designed the King Kong and Jaws exhibits down there in Florida. And he was worked for theme parks all around the world. And he said, um, I'm a Christian, I'm a creationist. Can I come and design your exhibits? I believe I can take them to a level, you know, equivalent of Disney and so on. And it's interesting. There, there's a whole story in regard to how we how we then were able to meet up with Patrick because mm -hmm. he was in America and he thought we weren't interested because we didn't respond, but we didn't get his email. And, yeah. <laughs> and so it goes on. He went back to Japan and then God brought us back in contact again. And then uh, Patrick uh, came here and, and he sort of did a model of what he would do. And in the end, what happened was... Uh, we handed Patrick a script. He just really wanted to do this. I mean, the Lord had obviously burdened him. He just really wanted to do this. I mean, we said, we don't have much money to pay or anything. I want to do this. And so I handed him a script of the seven seas. And that's what I always wanted to see, that linear walk through history, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, consummation. When people walk through and, and realize it was like this, then this happened, then this, then this, then this, then this then they understand the world, right? And then the first four C's, that's Genesis 1 to 11, which is the foundation for the rest of the Bible, for all of our doctrine. Uh, it's a foundation for our worldview. It's a foundation for everything, actually. There's nothing that's not founded in the first 11 chapters. And so I handed him the seven C's, and he went through and designed that walkthrough that we have. It's, it's, it's really interesting 
because people don't even realize that they're going down to a second level and he uses the same space two and three times, which sounds a bit weird, but because of the way it's done, he is using the space in multiple ways. And a museum, it's like, you know, do you know, do you know Doctor Who? A little bit. A little bit. Uh, and the time machine, yeah. the TARDIS. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the TARDIS, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, that was before you were born too. <laughs> the I've, the I've heard stories. You know, yeah. when, <laughs> when we first got television in the 60s, it was black and white TV. One of the first programs that I watched was Doctor Who. That, <laughs> was, before, that was before you were born. So uh, but it, it's sort of like walking into the TARDIS, which was – a telephone box that they had in England mm-hmm. and they they had that as their time machine and you'd walk in and then there's all this space inside. It's sort of like that with the Creation Museum. People come here and they don't realise how big it is. They like say, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger mm-hmm. and bigger because there's actually two levels to it and the way Patrick used the space. Yeah, Patrick did a great and, job uh, of just using that space and I, I, I think there was this, uh, this, this time that you... And Patrick and some of the other uh, founders were talking about it, how you guys built the museum first, and then Patrick was upset because you guys yeah. didn't do it well, his, the other way around. And- well, we'd already – we'd had all sorts of zoning issues and battles and different pieces of property and that. And when we came to this one, and then we had another battle and had a court case. I mean, there's a whole story to this. I, I tell people, if you want the story of what happened with this ministry and the Creation Museum and the Arkham County, it's sort of like reading the account – no, she used the word account. Yes, uh, not story. Reading the That's account a good word. Yeah. Uh, of what happened to the Israelites when they conquered the promised land. So they had, uh, you know, they had the, the miracle of, well, first of all, leaving Egypt and the miracle of the Red Sea and, and, and you know, Pharaoh and his men fighting, ch- chasing them and so on. And then, then you have the wandering in the desert and then you have the crossing of the Jordan River and then they had to conquer Jericho and then they have to conquer AI and they have to fight the giants and mm-hmm. it's just this continual battle all the way up. That's what it was like. That, that's what it's t- and that's <laughs> yeah. what it's still like. It's yeah. very much like that. I was going to say it still hasn't. It still hasn't I know, it hasn't waned at all. But when Patrick did this and came in, because of who he was, there are other people that knew him that said, I want to use my talents for the Lord. And so they came here. And then... Others would get to hear about it. And what happened, and this is how God just miraculously designed this. How many Christian organizations have their own design studios like Disney or Universal Studios where we have fabricators, artists, sculptors, we have welders, we have carpenters? It doesn't exist. I mean, uh, this is something unique in the entire I, world. It, it is. And yet God's put this team together that is, I mean, when you walk through our design studios, talent just exudes out of there. And it's just so fascinating to see and realize, wow, that's a legacy of Patrick. I mean, God raised mm-hmm. him up for really that. Is. And then God took him to be with him, and he leaves this legacy here. And he trained up others to take that on. And uh, so that's an example of God bringing the people to us, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you know, he, he's done the same with our speakers and researchers. I mean, you, you look at all the people you work with. And, you know, for you people yourselves, God has brought you all together here, right? You all didn't live in northern Kentucky. I was in no. Canada. So, <laughs> yeah, I was in Wisconsin. <laughs> Canada, Arizona, Wisconsin, Arizona. Arizona. Look, the desert. Look, like, yeah. God brings all these people in here together, and it's it's, it's like a whole Christian community. Uh, and it's like an oasis in the desert, actually, when you think of what's happening out there in the world. And God, God brings it all together, and, and you look back and say, wow. And yet I also know sometimes... I, I wish that when staff come in, they actually understood the pioneering days. Because, you know, when you look at an organization like this, there's the pioneering days and the pioneering aspects. Those of us who have been the pioneers, I know we've seen things, experienced things that others coming in have not. And they're experiencing the results of it. But when you experience it, it it's lessons in faith. Mm-hmm. and trusting God. And that's why I like to go back now and then with our own staff and go back and remind them of this history. Because, you know, when they come in today, it's, oh, here's this organization and I, I can be employed here. And, um, okay, and wh- what about a 401k? And what health benefits do you have? And yeah, Back then, know, 48 years ago, that, that wasn't a thing. <laughs> well, when, when I first went full-time to start a ministry in our home. And, you know, we started in 1977, went full-time, left school teaching in 1979, actually, October 1979. And we had no guarantees. But but see, I, I'd love to write a book one day, you know, Faith or Foolhardiness. Where do you draw the line between faith and foolhardiness? Mm-hmm. Because people say, so you just left and trusted God would supply your needs? Well, yes, but it's 
It's not just like that. Right. Right. So one of the things we did and I did was I called a number of our friends and others and wrote to people and said, if we went full time into this ministry, would you consider supporting us in some way financially or whatever mm -hmm. so that we could do this? And quite a number of those people said, yes, we would. Yeah, so it's that balance so, of faith and responsibility. So my responsibility was to check that out, right? And, you know, our parents said they would support us. And so then, as soon as I went full time, I wrote a letter to these people. I mean, you know, it might have been 50 letters. I thought that was a lot. <laughs> uh, now we now we mail out yeah, now 50, <laughs> <laughs> uh, But I mailed this letter and said, here's what we're doing, here's why in this ministry, and would you support us? And so there were people that would send us money. We had, for instance, a couple in our church that owned a fruit and vegetable shop. This would have been for at least two, three years where they faithfully every week would leave a box of fruit and vegetables for us to enable us to feed our kids and so on. And that's how we lived. So cool. You know, and in initial state, we didn't have a salary. You know, there's no such thing as a 401k. Uh, and, and then, you know, the ministry built up in Australia. And then I came to work with the Institute for Creation Research. And we sort of had to start again. We sold our house in Australia. And that was in the days when, when you buy them for a few thousand, sell them for a few thousand. Now the same house sells for hundreds of thousands. So we missed out on all that. Uh, but then we came over and lived in California and we bought a house there. And then, then when we worked with ICR for seven years before, you know, we we're going to return to Australia and we said, let's get this creation museum built. And that's a whole other story as to how all that came about. But then we sold the house in California before the boom, of course. It's always been like that all the way along. So we never <laughs> made anything from those. And then we come out here and we had nothing. And But again, it wasn't just saying, well, you know, where's the money going to come from? How are you going to live? Our, the ministry in Australia, of which I was uh, still a part of and on the board and founded and so on, uh, said, we will back you to enable you to do this because I was part of that ministry. You know, we'll help you financially and so on. So, so all the way along, there's stepping out in faith, but there's also the responsibility aspect. Yeah. And yeah. I know when we first ordered our first lot of books in Australia, that the publisher allowed us to order this order. And that you know, there was a big battle there to get them to do that for uh, other reasons. They had exclusive agencies and so on. But the first order came to $20,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I don't even know how we did this, but you, you know how much my wife and I had in the bank? We had like $200 oh. I remember, yeah. in the bank. <laughs> Yeah, there, it's actually one of my favorite parts of the uh, Fire in My Bones DVD that we have out there. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> keep and, going. And what we did was we just wrote to people and said, look, we had to bring these books in. People don't have this information. It's, they're not in Australia. Would, would you loan us money? Some people loaned us money. Um, some people gave us money. And I remember when we were, we were sitting on the, on the front landing of our house and we had 3,000 to go. We're thinking, how on earth are we going to get three more thousand? I mean, how's this going to happen? You know, we, we've already got 70. I mean, to us, that was like today, it was like raising $10 million, you know, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, in those days, $20,000 is an enormous amount. Of, I still look back on that and say, I don't believe we, how do we do that? We actually agreed to do that. And we were sitting there and a car pulls up. And I'm not kidding. This guy comes out and I recognized him. He went to a particular church in the area, he came and said, my wife and I really want to help you guys get this ministry into Australia. We really need these materials. And he said, I've had a burden to help you. And he hands us a check for $3,000. That's so, so cool. cool. That's so awesome. Every time <laughs> that, I hear that story, it just, that, it, that amazes chills, me. Yeah. That's the awesome God that we serve. Absolutely. And you and, can see his, yeah, just like patterns and how he works like that, providing what you need at the right time. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, we've seen miracle after miracle. We call them Red Sea events. Mm -hmm. Love it. And there's been so many Red Sea events. Another time we were seeing Sitting in the warehouse we'd re uh, we'd rented in the office there, and uh, we're having a board meeting, and we're saying we need a vehicle to be able to travel around uh, in in Australia, and because the old vehicle we had was worn out, we needed a vehicle. We didn't have any money, and we I'd gone down to a local used car place and found this Toyota Coaster. It was like a like a mini bus, so to speak, but it, it was there for sale secondhand for I think it was nine thousand dollars. And 9000 that's an awful lot of money. You know, and we didn't have any money like that. And we're at the board meeting and we're praying and talking about our need for this, for this vehicle so that I could travel around to churches. And while we're praying, and we're praying for a vehicle, while we're praying, the phone rings. 
And so I, I went over and answered, because I normally didn't ring after hours when we were there. I, I went over and answered. I think we just finished praying so uh, for the vehicle. Went over and answered it. It was a local businessman who said, hey, listen, um, I was just thinking about you guys and the ministry you started and that. And he said, I got a little bit of money here. And he said, I was wondering, do you have a specific need at the moment? Wow. And I said, yeah, we... we we actually need a vehicle and we've got one in mind. And he said, well, I've got $9,000 here. <laughs> wow. I, it was the exact wow. amount that this this uh, vehicle was going to cost. I think it was nine. It was either nine or ten, but I know it was the exact amount. It's so amazing to see the provision of, of God throughout all of it and mm -hmm. all of the faithfulness. And you mentioned responsibility and, and the obedience. And you were talking about the battles. It's a testament to you, too, for standing firm on the authority of God's word through all of that. And I'm curious to know, and we talk about worldview a lot here and the, the importance of standing on a biblical worldview here at the ministry. There were people in your life that influenced you to stand on the authority of God's word and a biblical worldview. So who are the people in your life that influenced you to do that? Well, the people that influenced me the most, and this is how it always should be, actually, were my parents, mm -hmm. my father and my mother. My mother was such a godly, godly lady. She just loved the Lord, and she just loved telling people about Jesus. And right from when we're born, I mean, well, I can't quite remember that far back, but uh, I know from as far back as I can remember, put it that way, when I was a little boy, she would be kneeling down with us beside our bed and teaching us to pray and teaching us verses of scripture and she drummed things into us like you know god first other second yourself last always do that always remember it's only what's done for jesus at last and my father always stood on the authority of the word of god he you know his father died when he was 16 and so when he was dying in hospital he told one of my brothers that um because i wasn't there at the time but he said that uh, when his earthly father died, he then turned to the words of his heavenly father and just saturated himself in the word of God. And he hated compromise. Mm. And he was always standing against the liberal theologians of the day. And if the pastor uh, compromised God's word, he would challenge that pastor uh, lovingly, but he would challenge him firmly nonetheless. Or, you know, if they were handing out a devotional book uh, to the congregation and in there one of the devotions was on the flood and it was saying Noah's flood was local. Well, he would go up and say, you can't do this. You can't hand this out. This is undermining God's word. You know, all of that impacted me greatly. And uh, I, I remember when I was, I think it was 12 years old, a uh, church we were in, the pastor, it was a Presbyterian church. We just moved to this area and I was either 11, 11 to 12. And the pastor got up, it was a Presbyterian church, and he talked about evolution and you you can believe in evolution added to the Bible. It's the first time I ever heard, heard, heard of evolution. You know, that's interesting. At the first church, time I ever church. heard of evolution wow. was at church. <laughs> and my parents, they were livid. You can't undermine God's word. If you give up Genesis, you give up the whole Bible. And they left that church. Mm. Um, and that was a year, if, for a funny story for you, that was the year. We used to have, um, what do you call them over here, costume parties? We, they call them fancy dress balls in okay. Australia. Okay. And uh, they had them at school. They have their fancy dress time. They'd, you'd come dressed up as Robin Hood or whatever, you know, all that sort of thing. And so that year, because of that, my parents dressed me up in, in an ape suit with an ape mask. <laughs> and, and I had a potted plant with a tree. It said, my family tree yeah. as a sign. Yeah. It was a That's spoof fired. on it. By a the spoof way, if you guys want to see that picture, make sure you guys pick up the Fire in My Bones DVD. You guys can see it for yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, it was funny to look back on that picture and say, oh, yeah, that was my parents. That was their spoof on evolution. Yeah, that's that's so what it's all about. Yeah, so speaking of Christian parents and really raising up the next generation to stand firmly on the authority of God's Word and the truth of God's Word, we have a resource that you wrote called Will They Stand? Um, Parenting Kids to Face the Giant. So go ahead and give us a quick overview of why, what, what really motivated you to write that book. You know, some people say this is the most powerful book I've written. That's, that's uh, my opinion. It's certainly different to any other book I've written. And, and it's all about the family, because the family is the first and most fundamental of all human institutions God ordained in Scripture, and the family is the educational unit God uses to, to transfer that spiritual legacy from one generation to the next. And the devil knows you destroy the family, mm -hmm. you destroy the educational unit of the nation, you destroy the culture, you destroy the family. And, and if you destroy the family, you stop that uh, legacy being transferred to the next generation. You know, that's why, remember when Joshua crossed Jericho as a, a miracle, and God said to Joshua to get the people to get 12 stones, build a memorial. So when your children ask, what do these mean? 
you will not forget to pass on that spiritual legacy to the next generation. And so because the family has been under such incredible attack, I mean, there's a war on the family, a war on children. It's a war that we're all involved in, the spiritual war. We see families collapsing all around us. We see generational loss from the church. And so I wrote this, and a lot of it, 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 there's a lot of testimony to my own parents and how they trained us and how my father taught us to stand on God's word and to never compromise. And that's why we have an exhibit down in Legacy Hall here at the Creation Museum in the lobby about my parents and my father's Bible there and little Noah's Ark he built me and so on, challenging people, what legacy are you leaving in this world? Because really the, this ministry that impacts tens of millions of people a year of Answers Genesis, Ark Encounter Creation Museum, or Answers Academy Christian School is a legacy of parents who taught their children to stand on God's word, taught us to answer questions. My father taught us apologetics. We didn't use the word then, but that's what he did. He was giving us answers to the liberal critics of the day, teaching us apologetics. And my mo godly mother teaching us to pray and teaching us God's word as well. And just the great uh, testimony she had of seeing her witness to, to other people. And uh, so this is all about, too, the roles of men and women and how to train up godly offspring. And you can't just hand your kids over to the world to be trained. You know, people say, our kids need to be salt. They should be out there in the public schools. You can't be salt till you have it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this, exactly. this book, I deal with that, make that very, very clear. And, uh, you know, once salt's contaminated, it's good for nothing. So this is a real challenge to parents. This it is really, really was for me. It, it's really the yeah. case for Christian education mm. that starts in the home. That's what it's all about. Yeah, I remember the first time I read that book, it was two years ago. I don't know if you remember this, but I came in for the interview with you and and Georgia and everyone else and Dan's Rodell. I remember at the end of the interview, you gave me that book and you said to read it. And then over the next uh, month or so, I just devoured it. And I was like, wow, this was, it, it really was, in my opinion, the most powerful book that you've ever written. It really impacted me big time in terms of a father, making sure I lay down that foundation that my kids need that's gonna, against a culture that's gonna seek to eliminate their faith, that's gonna challenge them. And let's make sure that our kids are ready. So um, just praise God for that. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks so much for sharing that with us. We encourage you to uh, pick up the book, to head to our website, answersingenesis.org, hop on answers.tv. You can find a lot more of Ken Ham's resources as well as his testimony, Fire in My Bones. We're going to pick up the conversation next time. So meanwhile, hope you tune back in and please keep standing on the truth of God's word with zero compromise. See you guys later. God bless.